C.S. Lewis always had a way with words. One of my favorite lines is his description of converting to Christianity from atheism. He came kicking, struggling, resentful, and darting his eyes in every direction for a chance to escape. But he was convinced by his Oxford colleague and friend, J.R.R. Tolkien. He then became a Christian apologist, a writer, a scholar, a lecturer. He's been a resource for me in many of my studies concerning topics within the Christian faith. The piece I will be sharing with you guys today is an insightful look into the pressures of fitting in with the in crowd. And although I won't be able to address it in my short speech today, I hope that you will all take a look at his proposal of what a wholesome group looks like. Without further ado, I present to you the Inner Ring, the Memorial Lecture at King's College, University of London in 1944. In the novel War and Peace, the young second lieutenant, Boris Dubrowski, discovers that there exists two different systems or hierarchies. The one is printed in some little red book, and anyone can easily read it up. It also remains constant. A general is always superior to a colonel, and a colonel to a captain. The other is not printed anywhere. You are never formally and explicitly admitted by anyone. You discover gradually that it exists and that you're outside of it. And then later, perhaps, you're inside of it. It is not easy, even in a given moment, to see who is inside and who is outside. Some people are obviously in and some are obviously out, but there are always several on the borderline. From inside, it may be called you and Tony and me, when it is very secure and comparatively stable in membership it calls itself we. From the outside, if you have despaired of getting into it, we call it that gang, or they, or the inner ring. Badly as I may have described it, I hope you will all have recognized the thing that I am referring to. You have met the phenomenon of an inner ring. You discovered one at your house and school before the end of the first term. Perhaps you discovered that within the ring, there was another ring yet more inner. You were beginning, in fact, to pierce through the skins of an onion. And here, too, at your university, shall I be wrong in assuming that at this very moment, invisible to me, there are several rings present in this room? All of this is rather obvious. I wonder if you'll say the same with my next step, which is this. I believe that in all men's lives at certain periods, and in many men's lives at all periods between infancy and extreme old age, one of the most dominant elements is the desire to be inside the local ring and the terror of being left outside. I will ask only one question, and it is, of course, a rhetorical question. In the whole of your life as you now remember it, has a desire to be on the right side of that invisible line ever prompted you to any act or word on which in the cold, small hours of a wakeful night, you can look back with satisfaction? If so, your case is more fortunate than most. It would be polite and charitable, and in view of your age, reasonable too, to suppose that none of you is yet a scoundrel. On the other hand, by the mere law of averages, I am saying nothing against free will. It is almost certain that at least two or three of you, before you die, will have become something very like scoundrels. There must be in the room the makings of at least that number of unscrupulous, treacherous, ruthless egotists. The choice is still before you, and I hope that you will not take my hard words about you possible future characters as a token of disrespect to your present characters. If you are drawn in, merely because at that moment when the cup was so near to your lips that you cannot bear to be thrust back into the cold outer world again, it would be so terrible to see that other man's face, that 
genial, confidential, delightfully sophisticated face turns suddenly cold and contemptuous to know that you have been tried for the inner ring and rejected. And if you are drawn in, next week it'll be something a little further from the rules, and next year something further still, but all in the jolliest, friendliest spirit. And it may end in a crash, a scandal, and penal servitude. It may end in millions of peerage and giving the prizes at your old school. But you will be a scoundrel. Of all the passions, the passion for the inner ring is the most skillful at making a man who is not yet a very bad man do very bad things. Once the first novelty is worn off, the members of this circle will be no more interesting than your old friends. Why should they be? You are not looking for virtue or kindness or loyalty or humor or learning or wit or any <coughs> of the things that really matter. You merely wanted to be in. And that is a pleasure that cannot last. <laughs> By the very act of admitting you, it's lost its magic. As soon as your new associates have been stale to you by custom, you'll be looking for another ring. The rainbow's end will still be ahead of you. And you will always find them hard to enter for a reason you very well know. Your genuine inner ring exists for exclusion. <laughs> There'd be no fun if there were no outsiders. The invisible line would have no meaning unless most people were on the wrong side of it. Exclusion is no accident. It is the essence. You are trying to peel an onion. And if you succeed, there will be nothing left. Until you conquer the fear of being an outsider, an outsider you will remain. 